It was the moment he was finally in front of the camera and under the spotlight. But tonight's interview with David Cameron has elicited one big question. Has there ever been a major leader striking quite such a regretful tone? In the run-up to doing this interview, an awful lot of people have said the same thing to me, and that is, I hope you're going to ask him to apologise for the mess he left. So, Well, I'm deeply sorry about all that's happened. There isn't a day that goes by when I don't think about all the decisions I made and all that has followed. But when I go back to that decision that Britain's position needed to be sorted and we needed a renegotiation and a referendum, I believe then that was the right approach. I think I made lots of mistakes along the way, but I'm So I'm you don't have any regrets? Pained. I have huge regrets. I, I regret that we lost the campaign. I regret I let expectations about the negotiation run far too high. Uh, I regret some of the individual decisions we made in the campaign. I think perhaps there's a case to say the timing could have been different. It's haunting you, would you say that? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, this is a huge decision for our country and I think we've taken the wrong path. He uses the words regret, fail and sorry an awful lot tonight. If you're asking me, do I have regrets? Yes. Am I sorry about the state the country's got into? Yes. Do I feel I have some responsibility for that? Yes. It was my referendum, my campaign, my decision to try and renegotiate. And I accept all of those things. And people, including those watching this programme, will have to decide how much blame to put on me. I but think... I accept, and I, I, you know, I can't put it more bluntly than this, I accept that that attempt failed. If one day, you're looking at your grandchildren and they're asking you about the direction that Britain has taken. If the union has broken up, will you really say to them that it was still the right decision, it was still worth it? Well, I think I will still make the argument that to me, it was inevitable. This idea that there weren't big forces at work, that we had to settle either inside or outside, I, I, I think is, that is the case. The original interview was long and there were inevitably parts we didn't air tonight, including some highly colourful accounts of life at the top of the strange world inhabited by a leader. There was this on Obama. There's a moment where you were describing, slightly surreally, you know, President Obama tucking you up in his bed on Air Force One. Well, we had been to see some basketball game in Ohio and it was 12, 12 o'clock at night and the United States, so sort of four or five in the morning in the UK, and he said, you're looking a bit uh, exhausted. Why don't you go and lie down in my bed? And I said, thank you very much. And there was this rather surreal scene as he tucked me up in the, at the sort of crest of the White House. And he said, as he did it, he said, I bet um, uh, President Roosevelt never did this for Winston Churchill. It's slightly strange. He didn't read you a bedtime story. It didn't, it didn't, no. it was <laughs> nothing inappropriate. Yeah. And how about What's this on the former Italian Prime Minister, Silvio Berlusconi? Well, I think at the time I didn't understand um, uh, how he'd been so successful um, because he did come to European summits and make the most extraordinary interventions. I remember once he pushed the button on the microphone in front of him at sort of two o'clock in the morning and said, if these meetings are going to be going on so long, you should all do what I've done and take a mistress in Brussels. No one knew where to look and look at their feet. He is still a young man. So what now for him? Will he return to frontline politics, do you think? No. Uh, I always, you know, want to help. I love this country. I care passionately about what happens. But um, I, I think the idea of going back to frontline politics is not going to happen, nor should it.